Amen. So, last chapter of Deuteronomy chapter um, Deuteronomy chapter thirty four. Excuse me. So we're wrapping up a great book, um, and we'll be getting into a new one Thursday. And if you want to know what it is, you got to come out Thursday. All right. People have been trying to get it out of me, but I'm like a steel trap, man. You ain't gonna get it out. You ain't gonna pry it open. Okay. I almost worked a hint in. I didn't may into the sermon, so if you can figure, it's pretty obvious, I'm probably not going to do it. If I said it, everyone would probably figure it out. But uh, anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 34, uh, you know, these last few chapters have been really, um, I think, some of the most powerful chapters just because we're seeing a great man of God pass off the scene, you know, and he's, of course, giving his last words to the children of Israel. And then we're going to kind of just get into the details a little bit tonight about exactly what transpired at the end of his life. And it says there in verse 1, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto, Mount Nebo, uh, Mount, unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan and all Na uh, Naphtali and all the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees unto Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So obviously this is a, a huge moment, you know, in, in not just in Moses' life, but in, really in the history of the children of Israel. He said there in verse 4 that this is a land that he swore unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I mean, this is, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years uh, later, this, 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 uh, this promise is finally coming true. You know, Abraham had known about this promise. When he was first told, you know, God showed him and, and said, I'm going to, you know, wherever, you know uh, wherever your foot falls, you know, that's going to be the inheritance that I give to your seed. So this is a promise that God has been, uh, you know, holding in reserve to, to, to follow through on for many, many years, you know, hundreds of years. And so what a great moment, you know, when he's already, uh, when he's finally getting ready to uh, come through on that and, and deliver on that promise that he made so long ago. And it's interesting, too, that when he shows him the land, he names it. You know, of course, the author is writing, you know, retro retroactively and, and, and telling us what the names of the land were. But, you know, you can kind of get the sense that it was such a sure thing that the Bible's already naming that land before they'd even gotten over there. So it just goes to show you that when God makes a promise, you know, you can count on it. You know, one that it's going to happen and that he's going to keep his promises. <coughs> but really, kind of the highlight here is the fact that God took him up on this mountain and he says, I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou will not go over thither. And really, you say, well, that seems kind of rough. You know, why did, why, why isn't he let him go over there? And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. But really, and God even taking him up there and, and allowing him to even see it with his eyes is actually, you know, God being merciful unto Moses. You know, he could have just brought him up there and, and said, you know, okay, now it's time for you to die and not shown him the land. So he at least gives them that courtesy, you know, for everything that Moses had done and everything that he had accomplished, you know, God was merciful unto him and saying, I'm going to at least let you see it. You know, I'm going I'm to show you this land. And really that had to be quite a moment for Moses. You know, we read these stories and we have to remember that we're reading about people who are uh, people like me and you, you know, men of like passions. You know, what would it, so we can often put ourselves in their position and wonder, you know, what it would be like at that moment you know what would it be like to be Moses going up that mountain knowing this is the day you know you're, you're walking basically to your death you know and then seeing that land I mean and, and what a moment that must have been and you have to wonder what Moses would have felt like what were things that he might have felt and of course this is just all speculation on my part we don't really know what he felt you know I kind of touched on this last week you know and, and at least made the point that he might have felt maybe like he regretted his sin a little bit more at that point you know, I'm sure he did. You know, he was felt bad for what had happened, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But he might have seen that land and said, "Man, I really, I really messed up." You know, and I already talked about this. I don't really develop this point over, you know, too much. But often that's what sin does to us. You know, we think, "Oh, well, I'm enjoy this sin. I'm going to get involved in this sin," and, you know, and it, and and it might cost me something. It might not, or we 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 say it's worth it, and then later we see how much it really cost us, and we and we regret it. Maybe that's what went through his mind. I don't know. But maybe he got up there and he might have felt, you know, grateful. I tend to think this is probably something more likely than what he felt, that he was grateful for what the Lord had done and what he was going to do. Because you have to remember the great thing about Moses through all of it is that he was a man who had a heart for the children of Israel. You know, we've seen that. 
through his life. You know, when he had opportunity to take their place where God said, I'm going to wipe them out and start over with you. You know, he stopped, he, he prayed and entreated the Lord and said, no, Lord, you know, and, and he entreated those people. And he was like a father to them. You know, he said he carried them in his bosom. You know, he, and he, he was burdened with these people. So I, I can't help but feel that when he got up there, he probably took a look at that land and might have been just feeling very grateful for everything that God had done for Israel, all the mercy he had shown and the fact that he's about to follow through on this promise and what he was about to do for Israel's sake. Now, if you would, keep something in, in Deuteronomy 34, but go back to chapter 3. Go back to chapter 3. <clears throat> you see, Moses definitely desired to go on with the people of God. You know, we know that from Scripture, that Moses, it was his heart's desire to go over into that land and continue to, to be a, a leader under the people and, and to see all the things that God was going to do. And he said in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 24, he said, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan. So if you recall at this point, he's already been told that he's not going to go over. And now he's kind of imploring God. You know, and that, you know, obviously it doesn't work out. God has his reasons why he's not going to let him go over. But we can read this and we can kind of see there's kind of a, maybe an example or a pattern of how to maybe, you know, uh, ask somebody for something that you want. You know, he starts out by saying, you know, I, you've shown thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. You know, what God is, is there in heaven and earth? And I don't think he's just buttering up God. I think he sincerely means every bit of this. You know, and sometimes that's, you know, then he asks. You know, first he pays God some compliments. He gives God some praise. You know, and it's sincere. It's from the heart. And then he makes his supplication known. You know, that would be a good lesson for us to learn. You know, when we pray to God. And maybe instead of just going to God and making our list of demands, it might take, God might appreciate if we would just stop and maybe just, you know, praise him a little bit. Amen. I mean, that's when Jesus taught his disciples to pray. That's the first thing he told them to say. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, before you get into forgive us our debts and our debtors and give us our daily bread, he starts out with hallowed be thy name. So that's just a good pattern of prayer, I think, or a good way to make your supplications known unto God. You know, before we just start, you know, asking for things, maybe give God some praise. Now, you might not get the answer you like all the same, but it's still, you know, it's still worth it because it's, if it's especially if it's sincere and true and you mean it. But he says, uh, you know, he goes on, he says, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain, and Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth for me for your sakes. Now that's important. Moses here is saying, look, God was mad at me because of you. Because he's kind of, he, remember, he's rehearsing this in the ears of Israel. And he's, he's saying, look, you guys are the reason God was mad with me. Now, there is a grain of truth to that because of the fact that Moses became very frustrated with them, and that's what caused him to sin. Okay? Now, Moses is still responsible for what he did. You know, it was still his fault. He should have not made the mistake that he did, but he did it. He said he, he, was, uh, he was wrong with me for your sakes. We'll look at that again here in a minute. And he said, and he would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter. You know, and Moses had, uh, you know, was so obedient to the Lord that when he said that, he, he was like, okay. And he knew that God had made up his mind. And, and Moses shows us that, you know, we read this here in Deuteronomy 3, and then we see later in Deuteronomy 34 that God follows through exactly what he said he was going to do, like saying, hey, I'm not going to let you go over. And when he gets this answer, you know, don't talk to me about it anymore, Moses. I made up my mind. Moses leaves it alone. He doesn't keep pestering and badgering and trying. He just accepts what's coming. You know, and sometimes that's, that's just the way we have to take life. You know, if we've committed sin, if we've gotten, you know, uh, you know we're going to have to suffer those consequences. Now, there's always grace and there's always mercy and God is long-suffering. We understand that. But there's also consequences that come with sin that even though we have God's forgiveness, even though, you know, God has, has forgotten that, you know, there's still consequences that come. And we can't just keep throwing a fit every time we have to deal with those consequences. We just have to accept them and move on with our life. And I think that's what Moses is kind of showing us here. Now, if you would, uh, keep some in Deuteronomy 34, I'm sure you have, but go over to Numbers chapter 20. We're going to talk a little bit about exactly what it was that prevented Moses from going over into the Promised Land. 
so he says um, <coughs> he's not going to let him go over. <coughs> and he gives the reason why here in Numbers 20 we see the, the, the explanation for it. And really the reason why God wasn't allowing Moses to go over in short is because of the fact that here in Numbers 20 we see Moses ruin a great picture of Jesus Christ or a foreshadowing of Christ in the Old Testament. So let's read about it. He says in verse 1, it says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now I'm going to make kind of a sub point here because this is worth bringing up. You know, it says Miriam died there. Now I don't think that's a small detail. You know, that, I mean, to us it is, and we, in, the, in the big picture of things, of course, we understand it is. But we have to understand that's Moses' sister, you know, and that, that's something that I'm sure affected Moses. You know, when Moses' uh, you know, sibling is passing away, you know, I, he probably understood that, you know, she's in heaven and, and all of that. And we understand that when we have saved loved ones that die, that uh, they're with the Lord. But there is still a mourning, you know. Now, we don't mourn like others who have no hope, you know, but there is still an impact there. You know, there, there is, you know, some kind of a... You know, people are affected on a certain level. And I'm sure Moses, to some degree, was going through some kind of mourning. You know, he was sad to t see that happen because he's human, just like everybody else. And, you know, it, it, I just think it's interesting, the timing here. You know, he brings them over, Miriam dies, and then that's when the congregation decides to start complaining. That's when they start getting mad. Look there in verse 2, the very next verse. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron, and the people chode with Moses and spake, uh, and spake, saying, Would God that we had, had died when our brethren died before the Lord. They'd rather say, We'd be better off dead, Moses. And why have you brought us up, uh, brought up the congregation of the Lord into the wilderness, uh, that we and our cattle should die there? And you've made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place. It's like they're forgetting how bad Egypt was. And they're saying, This is the evil place. We had a better in Egypt under hard bondage. <coughs> it is a place of no seed or of figs or of vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Now, what's frustrating about this, you say, well, that sounds like a reasonable complaint. But you have to remember, they've already been through this, and Moses, you know, remember he split the rock and, and waters get gushed out of the rock? They've already been through this exact situation. And they've seen God work miracles. And specifically, you know, not just the miracles of, of what happened in Egypt and all the Red Sea and all those m just miracles, just amazing things that they would have seen. But they've specifically been through this before, not very long ago. They've been in this exact same position and watched God just miraculously pour out water to them out of a rock. So, you know, it, it, you could see kind of how these people are very, why God calls them stiff-necked, why God calls them hard-hearted and rebellious, because that's just what they are. <laughs> but what I want to point out here is that, you know, Moses is kind of going through a personal trial here. I mean, his sister dies, you know, and, and, and here's the thing I want us to understand that as leaders, you know, and this goes for not just, I'm not talking about just, you know, men of God. I'm talking about if you're a leader, if you're a dad, if you're a mom, if you're, you know, if you help maybe at work, you're a supervisor, whatever. Leader people in leadership understand that you don't have the luxury of choosing when people are going to get a bad attitude. I mean, moms can attest to that, right? You know, the, the kid starts throwing a fit, and it's like, you know, I don't know when a good time for that is, you know. But you can't, you can't reason with the child and be like, can you, can you come back and do this next week around noon? And you know, that would be a better time for me for you to have a, a hissy fit right now. No, kids, I mean, that's the way it is for leaders. You know, when people, people will get a bad attitude when they decide they're going to get a bad attitude. And it doesn't matter if your sister just died. It doesn't matter if, if it's not a convenient time for you. That's, it's going to happen. So that's just kind of a side note. I thought it was worth kind of pointing out there. And, you know, and that that's goes for any of us that are in leadership. That is something that we need to keep in mind, that you need to be patient. And look how he handles it. Moses, you know, and Moses really at this point could have just been like, you idiots, you know, don't you remember? And could have really just scolded them and just said, you, I mean, we just went through this. What in the world is wrong with you? But what did he do? And it says in verse 6, And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly. You know, sometimes that's the best thing to do, is just get away from the source of the aggravation. And do what? They went to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces. 
you know, maybe, maybe we're in a position of leadership or we have somebody that's griping and complaining or there's some situation we're having to deal with. You know, rather just, you know, blowing up and getting angry and getting upset, and lashing out, it might be it's just better to just kind of say, hey, let me talk to you later about that and just go get along with God for a while. Maybe just go get on your face before God in private and, and bring it to him first before you decide to deal with it. And that's what Moses did. And I believe he handled it right. I mean, up to this point, he's handling things right. He's not just lashing out or, you know, trying to get back at him or, you know, getting into some kind of scuffle with him. He goes and gets with God. <coughs> you know, I, I read this and it's kind of like, this is like the spiritual version of counting backwards from 10. They tell you, like, so I've heard, you know, in anger management classes or whatever. I've never been. Maybe that's, maybe I need to go. I don't know. But, you know, they tell people, you know, if when you feel yourself getting upset, you know, just count backwards from 10. 10, 9, you know. I've never tried it. Probably should. But this is kind of like the spiritual version of that. You know, let me get away and just cool off. You know, let me talk to God for a while, and then I'll come back when and, and cooler heads will prevail. So he's doing it right. And then verse 7, he says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together. No, this doesn't sound like, well, what's going to happen here? He's taking a rod, he's getting everyone together. I was thinking, all right. No, I'm just kidding. And he goes, And Aaron thy brother, and speak unto the rock before their eyes. Now he's very specific here. He's giving very clear instructions. He didn't say go over the rock with the rod and just do whatever you feel like doing. And we'll get some water out of it. He said, go to that rock and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. I want them to see you do it. And it shall give forth water, and thou shalt, get, uh, and it sh thou shalt bring forth uh, to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. Now, if you recall, the first time he told them to smite the rock. Right? He told them to take that staff and hit the rock, and that split, and then the water came. But this time he's real clear. He said, I want you to go, and I want you to speak to it. <coughs> And it says in verse 9, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? So now you can already see Moses is kind of starting to lose his temper. You know, he's like, you rebels. He's kind of letting it kind of come out, right? Maybe he should have stayed in there a little longer. Maybe he should try counting down from 10. I don't know. But he's kind of getting... You could see the frustration that Moses has with these people. Maybe it's because Miriam died. Maybe it's just because he's been over this. Maybe because it's just over and over again. These people are murmuring and complaining, and he keeps having to remind them of who God is. But he says, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and with the rod, and he smote the rock twice. So he does not doing what God told him to do. right? And that's why he had to smite it twice. So you could kind of, and every time I read it, I get a little bit of a chuckle at it because you think about Moses, so it's just like, here you rebels, I'll get you water of this rock. Whack! And then nothing happens. <laughs> and they're all like, oh, sure, Moses. You, did you grab the right rod? I mean, you got the wrong one. And then he has to hit it a second time, and water came out abundantly. So God's up in heaven, the Lord's looking down, and he hits it, he goes, what are you doing? That's not what I said to do. I said, speak unto it. So maybe he's even kind of giving him a second chance here to get it right. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to speak unto it. Now, was Moses, now, I don't think Moses was deliberately going against God here. He's like, I know God speak, said speak unto it, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to hit it. I think Moses lost his temper. I think Moses is just seeing red. You know, he's, just, he's had enough of these people. Just, you know, they were hard people to deal with and to the point where God was ready to destroy him. And now he's, he's just in the heat of the moment what did God say to do? Uh, I don't know. And he hits it, right? So then, so then he, God's kind of just going, what are you doing? I told you to speak unto it. So then he hits it again. He's like, well, I can't have my man looking like a complete fool up there in front of all these people. Obviously, he doesn't remember what I told him in the, in the tabernacle, you know, 10 minutes ago or whatever. <laughs> but he doesn't just leave Moses hanging, right? And he doesn't leave the people hanging either. He gives them the water that they want and takes care of their needs. So he goes ahead and he, and, he, and, he, and he splits the rock, but that was, that was the transgression that he was guilty of. That was Moses' great sin that kept him out of the promised land. And you know, and we read that and, and we, we kind of scratch our heads and say, really, that's it? But we have to understand that this was a, a, a supposed to be a, a really uh, important picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. <coughs> 
And we'll get in that in a minute here, but what I kind of want to point out here, but, but before we get into the picture of Christ, is that what we see with Moses is that God doesn't just miraculously adjust your attitude. You know, Moses was handling things right, okay? People, the people were out of line. They should have known better. They should have known that God could have, you know, fed them in the wilderness, given them water in the wilderness. He's already done it. Okay, so Moses handles it right. He goes to the Lord and he gets in prayer, but then he comes out of there and it's like he hasn't, you know, his attitude really hasn't, he's still mad. He, he calls them rebels. And in the heat of his anger, you know, he, he, he doesn't follow God's clear instructions. And what that's showing us is that it's great that if we're going to the Lord. It's great if we're going in prayer. But prayer isn't this magical wand that God waves over you. Where God's just going to miraculously adjust your attitude. <coughs> you know, the time in the tabernacle didn't really seem to have benefited Moses, did it? I mean, he leaves the tabernacle with clear instructions and then immediately, you know, messes them up. See, because here's the thing. Prayer, prayer gives us the ability to change, but it doesn't change us. That's what I believe. I believe what you could, go to, what you could do is you go and pray, Lord, and you could confess that your, your, your heart's not right, you have the bad attitude, whatever it is. You can confess it, and then you can pray and ask God to give you the strength to change or the wisdom to, to, to change. You know, you can ask God, hey, help me to, to be better. But that doesn't mean that God is just going to automatically do it for you. God's, you know, and I've said this before, God's not a spiritual vending machine where if I just spend enough time on my knees, on my face, you know, contrite before God that I'll just stand up and all of a sudden my life will be perfect. My heart will be right. My attitude will be right. No, that's not how it works. You go and you pray and you confess and you ask for help, but then you have to walk out of that prayer closet. Moses had to leave the congregation and put into practice those things that he knew he needed to put in practice. So that's kind of a, a sub point there that I wanted to point out that, you know, hey, it's great that if you're handling things right, Moses, and going to the Lord, but don't just get, don't stand up off your, get up off your knees on your feet and just think, God, God has just miraculously changed my attitude. You, know, you have to put those things in practice when you get out there. And that's really a whole another sermon. But what we see happening here is that in smiting this rock, rather than speaking unto it like he was told, Moses ruins just great foreshadowing of Christ. And, I, and again, I'm not going to develop this a, a great deal. But the foreshadowing is this. So if you remember the first rock, he smote the rock. We can all kind of pick up pretty quick how that's a picture of Jesus. How, you know, he, he you know, uh, like he told the woman at the well, you know, ask me of the water of life and, you know, and, and, and I'll give it to you. You'll never thirst again, right? He's like that water. And he was, he, was, uh, he was bruised for our iniquities, right? He was smitten of us and afflicted, a man of sorrows, right? So we could see the picture there pretty easily. You know, Jesus was, was smitten. And because he was smitten, you know, he brought forth life. And the people were able to drink that water. But also, I think it's a great picture in the fact that he, God told him to speak to it, too. Because, you know, it's true that Jesus has smitten. In fact, he, you know, he died for the sins of the whole world, the Bible says. But does that mean everybody's saved? No. Who's saved? The people who do what? Call upon the name of the Lord. Those that use their mouth and speak to the rock. Right? I believe this is a great picture. That's why it says in Romans 10, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I believe that's the picture there. And people could have other ideas about exactly how that's a, a foreshadowing of Christ, but I believe that's, that's a, a valid interpretation of that. <coughs> and really, you know, again, that would be another great sermon, but we're trying to wrap up this chapter here, so let's move on in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34. So that was Moses' great transgression. And that's what cost him the promised land. And uh, actually, if you, before you go over there, Let's, let's, let's look at uh, verse 12, in, in, uh, if you're still there in Numbers. And he said, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, and said, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I, which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. So, <clears throat> Well, we don't, the, really the message you can get out of that whole scenario with Moses and the rock and them being rebels and everything is that you don't want to let other people's sin cause you to sin. You know, the people weren't right. You know, they were faithless. They were just unbelieving. You know, they were, they were in sin. 
but it, you could see how it also drove Moses let it get to him and it also drove him to commit sin <coughs> I mean the people they were re they were definitely rebels but is that an excuse for Moses to lose his cool is that an excuse for Moses to, to do what he did no not at all <coughs> but you can also kind of see how Moses said for your sakes the Lord was wrath with me you can see where he's coming from humanly speaking you know you guys upset me it was I was mad because of you you know now the right or wrong that is a how it was you know I, I don't know that it's an entirely that doesn't make Moses without excuse though however <coughs> but it goes on in verse uh, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 34 but that was his great sin you know and again I talked about this in, in a couple weeks ago in previous chapters I mean is that a, is that the worst thing you've ever read somebody doing in the Bible I mean, the people that are going to go over there, they've, they've seen and done worse things than that. I mean, there's people in the Bible, I and mean, we could talk about other great men of God that have did far more wicked things than what Moses did and suffered. I mean, they had their own set of consequences. But again, and I've made this point before, I won't belabor it, but when you, the more you know, the more you accountable you are. Unto whom much is given shall, also much, shall much also be required, the Bible says. So Moses, because he was so close to God, you know, had such clear instructions, he was without excuse. So even that little sin ended up costing him dearly. But let's move on here in Deuteronomy chapter 34. It says in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 34, in verse 5, So Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him. Now when it says he buried him, it's talking about the Lord buried him. I don't, I don't know, I can't think of anybody else that the Lord buried besides Moses. <clears throat> That's, that'd be one funeral service, right? That'd be a great funeral service. He goes on, he says, and he buried him in the land, uh, in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. So you can see even in this, God is still honoring Moses in a way. You know, he still thinks, he's still esteeming very highly. Remember, he's, he called him, um, he said, I, I will speak to Moses as a man doth his friend. I mean, that was how close the Lord was with Moses and Moses with the Lord. That he even took the time to bury him over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And that's really interesting. You know, that God purposely did it in a way that nobody could confine, come find him. Now, why did he do that? Well, there might have been a temptation for them to dig him up. You know, or, you know, and maybe even to, to, to worship him. You know, that when they get into some kind of idolatry or something, they might mistake, start thinking, oh, Moses was God. You know, that type of a thing. Maybe that's what God, why God does this in obscurity. You know, to make sure that nobody would come dig him up and try to worship him. say, no one would worship a dead body. Oh, yeah? You want to go down to San Xavier and kiss some bones? Because you can do that. They'll bring a saint through there, some so-called saint, and you can walk up there and pull back a little piece of cloth and kiss a dead man's bones. So people do that kind of thing. They get involved in that. I mean, they, they do that all the time, the Catholic Church. They've got all kinds of dead bodies laying around that they, they venerate and worship. <coughs> so anyway, I think maybe that's part of it because God didn't want them doing that. But for whatever reason, it's, to me it's just impressive that, you know, that Moses... Uh, you know, died this way. That God, you know, buries him himself and that no man knows the sepulcher. <clears throat> you know, because Moses, you know, and the fact that no man knows the sepulcher, that is impressive because of the fact that, you know, Moses was somebody. I mean, Moses wasn't somebody dying in obscurity. He wasn't, you know, just some, somebody that nobody knew. They, everyone knew who Moses was. I mean, they go on and they mourn for 30 days, right? And what's interesting, and if you would... Uh, Quickly turn over to Jude chapter 1. This comes up in Jude. You probably uh, uh, recall this passage. Yeah. That even, even the angels, you know, we, and we don't know the context here, but it's brought up, you know, dis are, are debating over the, the bearing of Moses, their, his body. It says in Jude chapter 1, look at verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. So there's just something about, I don't know, now, the Bible isn't real clear here as to what's going on, but what they're disputing about, he said he's, he's contending with the devil 
And he, they dispute about the body of Moses. What exactly was the dispute? I don't know. Was he saying, well, he's buried here. No, he's buried there. Or God didn't bury him. Yes, he did. I don't know exactly what the nature of the argument was. But here you have two, you know, the devil, first of all, and then you have Michael, the archangel, you know, discussing and debating over the body of Moses. You say, what, what is that about? I don't know. But it happens. And that's cool. <laughs> if you ask me. I don't know that anyone's going to be doing that about me when I pass on. There's not going to be disputing about me and my body. <coughs> and what, I mean, what, what, what can we get out of that? Well, what you could take from that is that there's some questions that are only going to be answered in heaven. I mean, we read the Bible sometimes, and there's things we read, and we just scratch our heads, and we ask other people, and they're, they're like, I don't know. And there's just some questions that are only going to be answered in heaven. I want to get to the bottom of that when I get there. I want to find out about that. <coughs> And, but what it also shows is the prominence of Moses. You know, that Moses was somebody that had such a high stature that even you have these angels debating about his burial. They're not, they're not disputing over the things he taught or did. They're disputing about his burial, his body. That's what they're disputing over. So it goes to show you that Moses, you know, was a man who rose to prominence. Now, what, did he do that by, you know, stepping on heads and, and, and telling everybody how great he was? Did he, did he hold, like, a national campaign and raise funds and go out and put signs in people's front yards and, and hold town hall meetings and rallies and debates? No. God had to come find him in the backside of the desert, yep. you know. And why did God choose him? Because he, cho he, would, he would rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. God saw his heart the kind of man he was, that he was the meekest of all men. And that's why he chose to use him. And that's why, and then, and, you know, and that's why he rose to such prominence. And the Bible says that you know, in due time, the Lord, that to humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God, and then in due time, the Lord shall lift you up. You know, if, we, you know, if we desire to be promoted, then chances are we're not going to be. But if, if our desire is to just serve the Lord humbly in whatever capacity he sees fit, that's when God will promote us. Because then we'll have the right motives, <coughs> like Moses. So let's, let's go on here in verse, and, uh, Deuteronomy 30, uh, 34, verse 7. So it says in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. So not a young man. He was 120 years old. And every time I read about anybody reaching that age, I always think about that news story I read about an old lady down here in Tucson who I think I reached 102, 105 or something like that. And she went to Taco Bell every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And what is your secret to success? She goes, well, I, and how are you celebrating this birthday? Because I think it fell on a Tuesday. So I'm doing whatever I do every Tuesday. I'm going to Taco Bell. <laughs> now, who's going to Taco Bell in Tucson? I don't know. <laughs> but she is. That should be a sin to go to Taco Bell when you live in Tucson. Anyway, not that old joke. <coughs> but, uh, you know, he reaches 120 years old. And, it, you know, he was an old man, but the Bible's real clear there at the end. It says, his, eyes, uh, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. You know, he was not you know, a weak old man. He was more than capable to go in that land and continue to serve God in a mighty way. And what that should show us is that, you know, sin can cause us from even the best of us, even the best of us, the best, the, the most the people that are just on fire for the Lord, living for God, living, uh, you know, a, a clean and, and godly life. You know, a little bit of sin can keep you from reaching your full potential. I mean, ever, sometimes you just think about what would happen if Moses had, had gotten to go over, you know, how, how things might have been different. You know, I mean, J Joshua, you know, is, for all the things he did right, he did make some mistakes. You know, they, Israel made some mistakes pretty quickly when they got over there. If you recall, they beat Jericho. And then, for, then you have Achan, you know, running in there and taking the, the golden wedge and the Babylonian garment and, and that whole fiasco. And then they run to Ai, you know, that, that happened too. They, didn't, they did not inquire of the Lord. And they, they, they suffered a loss at the second city, which was even smaller than Jericho. And they, you know, then they have the... Uh, I'm, trying, I'm drawing a blank. The people that feign themselves to be others. 
you know, and, and they made a covenant with the people of the land that they shouldn't have, right? So they made some mistakes. Now you have to wonder, what if Moses had been there? Would they have made those mistakes? Would those men that died of AI still be alive? You know, probably. I mean, Moses had a lot to offer, even at that old age. So what that shows us is that even a little bit of sin, you know, can rob you of some great potential. And, you know, if we let sin in our lives, it's going to rob us of, of being used of God. <clears throat> and that a godly life leads to a long life. I mean, 120 years old, that's a long life. You know, we're, we're, we'd be fortunate and blessed if we reach 80. You know, and, and if you want that, you know, you're going to have to live a godly life. If you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 3. We'll start to wrap this up. But it says in Proverbs chapter, you're going to Proverbs 3. <coughs> I say, wow, 120 years old. How did Moses make it? What was his secret? It wasn't Taco Bell. I can tell you that. It was because he ate oatmeal every morning. We know he spent 40 years at least eating manna, right? <coughs> Good luck getting any of that. But he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to the prayer, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. How are you going to live a li good life? Stay on God's good, good side. I mean, by all means, you know, eat the healthy food, get the exercise, do all that. That's important. But stay on God's good side. You know, don't, you know, refrain yourself from evil. And don't get God angry at you. I mean, Moses, Moses could have gone a lot farther and done a lot more, even than he already had. But God, you know, had to punish him for what he did. Proverbs chapter 3, look at verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. I mean, who doesn't want length of days? Who doesn't want a long, who doesn't want a long life of peace? He says, well, if you, that's what you want, then you have to forget not my law and let thine heart keep my commandments. <clears throat> he said, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. You know, obeying God's commandments are going to help you live a long life. One, because of, I mean, just the fact, a lot of sin is very detrimental to your physical health. And if you get right with God and you live, you know, you keep God's commandments, you forget not his law, if you bind it upon your neck, that's going to keep you from getting involved in a lot of things that are going to bring negative health consequences in your life. You know, we could think about the STDs and, and the, uh, you know, the effects of smoking and drinking and drug use and so on and so forth. Those are things that are all going to start to could cut back on your life significantly. Right. So, you know, keep God's commandments. You want to live a long life of peace? You want, to be ha you want to get to that old age and still be used of God? Keep God's commandments. You know, we talked about it earlier, too. I mean, Moses is 120 years old and he's ready, to, he's ready to go over and do more. And he spent the last 40 years of his life just doing the most, you know, amazing works that have ever been done. And, you know, and to, to, to by and large than anyone else. I mean, there rose not a prophet like him since. I mean, he did a lot of miracles, a lot of great things. But he was over 80 years old when he did them. And it just goes to show you that, you know, age is not a factor with the Lord. And we've preached about that. So let's go back and we'll wrap it up here in one last thought. <laughs> go over to Proverbs, or not, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 34. We'll pick it back up in verse 8 where he says, And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And I don't think that that was just, you know, uh, out of routine. That was, they didn't just lower the flag halfway. You know, they wept and they mourned. I think they, they really felt that loss. Because Moses, of who Moses was to them. They were endeared to him. I believe that. And he says in verse 9, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So again, this is something I touched on a little while ago, but it's this, 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 uh, this teaching of ordination, or laying on of hands, as the Bible calls it, being ordained. <coughs> Now, God recognizes the ordination of man. That we saw that, you know, God called, called Joshua to, to, to serve him, 
but then he called them to the tabernacle where Moses laid his hands on him. So it's, it was a two-part thing. Yes, there's the calling of God, but there's also the instrument of man that God uses to ordain a man into his, into his work and into his ministry. And you can't have one without the other. You know, either way. And we, have a lot, and, you know, we don't see a lot of people, you know, being called of God and then, or not being called, well, I guess I should be careful I say this. What we do see a lot of today, the problem is, is we have a lot of people saying, well, I'm called of God to be a pastor. You know, and what they mean is, I'm going to go start a YouTube ministry in my basement. And there's not, you know, no one's going to darken the door of, of my uh, so-called church. You know, and that's, that's the problem there. And they say, well, how, how do you, where do you, uh, where do you get the authority to do that? Well, God called me. But every time we see ordination in the Bible, God is also using man to confirm that calling, right? right? And we see it here with Joshua. He said, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of spirit and wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. So ordination, God recognizes the ordination of man by giving the spirit of wisdom uh, the, uh, unto the man that's ordained. I mean, why? let's read it again. Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Why? For, the Lord, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. So something happened when Moses put his hands upon Joshua and ordained him that God filled him with wisdom, showing us that, yes, God called Joshua, but then he recognizes the ordination of man by giving the spirit of wisdom unto Joshua. So ordination, you know, the, the laying on of hands is biblical. You know, 1 Timothy, Paul, read, Paul wrote to, to Timothy and said, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, you know, the preaching, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So the gift that was in Timothy was given to him, yes, by the preaching of, of, of Paul, but all, you know, I believe was, which was given the form, that was his charge, you know, when he was ordained, he would preach to him. But then they also laid, their, uh, he had his hands laid upon him, showing again that this is a biblical concept, that ordination or having your hand, being ordained of man, you know, is biblical. That's how, that's how people get into the ministry. Not by just, you know, I dub myself pastor and I'm going to go start a YouTube ministry. That's bogus. <clears throat> and what we see, so, so the guy that wants to skip that part, okay, the guy who wants to say, well, I don't need the laying on of hands. I don't need man to lay hands on me and ordain me into the ministry. You know, they're not granted that wisdom. They're not given that wisdom. They don't have it. I mean, they're fools to begin with if they think that's how it's done. Because again, remember in Hebrews, we talked about this. It says it's one of the principal doctrines of Christ, meaning it's like beginner level. Laying on of hands. This is not a complicated subject. And if they can't get that right, they're fools to begin with. And then they're going to go upon, they're going to go out and take upon the, uh, themselves that office, an office that has to be earned. You know, they, those people are completely devoid of wisdom. And uh, we shouldn't have anything to do with them. And people that follow them are as foolish as they are. <coughs> now, let's, let's close it up here in verse 10. He says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, there were some men that we could think about that God spoke to. You, know, you think of Elijah, when God came and spoke to him upon Mount Sinai in a still, small voice, right? But he was never put in a cleft of the rock and saw God's hinder parts. His face never glowed from having spoken with God, being spent so much time with the Lord. On more than one occasion, spending 40 days and 40 nights in God's presence. I mean, Moses really was a very unique prophet. And, and you know, I was thinking about this too. Because like, we always talk about, man, who would you like to meet in heaven? But have you ever, have you ever met somebody that you had a lot of respect for, like when you first meet them? It's kind of intimidating. You're kind of like, oh, now that I got him here, you know, uh, I better come up with something good to say. <laughs> I mean, you think, I want to meet Moses. I don't know, man. I might put that off for a while, gain some confidence. <laughs> he might go, I go, might go meet some other people. I mean, Moses, to me, seems like he might, I'm not that he'd be a jerk or anything, but he's just, he's, I mean, he was a, a mighty man of God. There's just nobody else like him. <clears throat> and he says that he, there was not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants. And to all that mighty hand and in the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. 
So Moses, you know, he's, he's the star of Deuteronomy. I mean, really, I mean, obviously it's the Lord, but humanly speaking, I mean, he was a, a, a vessel that God used like nobody else. I and mean, he's a very important character in the Bible, obviously. And we see here that he becomes the standard by which all other prophets are measured. I mean, everybody else is measured. And few other people are mentioned in the same breath, breath with Moses. It comes up time and time in, in, in Scripture. If you seek that out, if you look it up, you'll see certain other prophets that are mentioned along with Moses. And to be mentioned with Moses as a prophet is a great honor. Because there's no, I mean, he is the standard. That's what the Bible's saying here. There's none like him. Well, really, what is it that made him so great? Well, it says there, in all, he was, he, that there was not a prophet since like unto, uh, in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord no face to face, and all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do. You know, Moses didn't take this upon himself. He was, went and did what he was told. He was obedient. That's what made him great. <coughs> And, you know, that's the best thing that any, you know, we say, well, I want to have, you know, when I pass on, I want people to say good things about me. But that's really the best thing that anybody can say of, of any of us. The best thing that can be said of any of us is that we serve the Lord. Amen. That's what's said of Moses. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of great things here, but he, it says the Lord sent him to do these things. And God used him. And that's his great legacy is the, the fact that he served God. You know, you can have that legacy today too. We can have the same legacy as Moses. Now, are we going to do the same works that he did? You know, are we going to turn the dust into lice? You know, are we going to turn the rivers of water into blood? Are we going to call up frogs, you know, and all that? No. But we can go out and we can preach the gospel. We can, we can preach sermons. We can raise families. And we can serve God just like Moses did. And, you know, that can be said of us, that we, we did what the Lord sent us to do. And if you can end your life having that said about you, you've lived a good life. You know, you've lived a life worth living. <coughs> but here's the thing. Moses would never have the life he did if he didn't obey and gone to Egypt. So you want that legacy, then you've got to be like Moses. You've got to obey. And you've got to be meek. And you've got to be in it for the right reasons. Let's go ahead and pray.